Um, thank you, uh, Fiona, for the introduction. And uh, I just want to thank, before I get started, Nick and Glenn and Madeline, the folks who put together this conference. Can you just give them a round of applause? They are uh, they're amazing. And, and from the moment that I met Nick uh, at a conference in the States um, until I got here, they have been professional and just fantastic to work with. And this is uh, a very, very great gathering, so I want to thank them. Uh, it's also been great. I spent the whole week here uh, in Melbourne, and it's been a fantastic uh, city. Uh, and I was I used to say when I would go to like a, a really hip party, that's very Brooklyn. Um, and I think when I go back to the States, I'm going to say that's very Melbourne. Uh, when I go to something that, you know, is very fun and hip. Um, so thank you. And, uh, uh, you guys seem to have had a good night at the party last night. Uh, they, they know how to throw a conference and also how to throw a party. So uh, I apologize for the video I'm going to show you in a minute. Not quite yet, uh, but I don't want to wake you up. Um, it's also just been great to be in a community of, of organizers. I love to be in a, in a community of organizers and to be around other organizers. Um, the work that you all are doing is so critically important and it's so great to see you coming together and, and building bonds and you know I was asked to come here to share a little bit about what I've done over the last 10 years or so in, in the States but I've learned I hope uh, as much from you I've definitely learned as much from you as I hope I can give back today uh, even just a smidgen of that to you so um, but as organizers um, I thought I'd start with a story and instead of starting with at the beginning, I kind of wanted to start in the middle. Um, and I thought I could kind of try to summarize with some words, but I thought better, better yet to use a video that my, uh, my uh, deputy field director from the campaign sent me last night to remind me of what happened a year ago last night. when we found out that we had re-elected Barack Obama, President of the United States. And I want to share it to you, with you because uh, it, it, I think it captures better than anything the kind of emotions that we felt at the moment. But I actually wanted to start my story in another boiler room, what we call our sort of war room, the election day operation, where we're seeing numbers come in nine years ago. In 2004, I was a Deputy National Field Director for John Kerry's campaign. I had worked for Howard Dean before then. I spent two years of my life trying to make sure that George W. Bush was not re-elected. I apologize um, for that. Um, and I sat there on election day with what at the time as a young organizer was a great job. We had all the states, <coughs> tables for all the different states all, all around the boiler room, and we were getting numbers throughout the day. And my job was to be able to take the numbers coming back from Ohio and Florida from the tables, walk the numbers with a little bit of analytics, talk to folks, and then walk that, those numbers and the interpretation back to the senior staff on John Kerry's presidential campaign. There is not a worse job in the world. There is not a worse job in the world to go back to the leadership of the campaign and say at one point, we're definitely not going to win Florida, let's look at Ohio, there's a chance. And then to walk back a few minutes later and say, we are not doing well in Ohio. And then to walk back an hour later and say, that speech, the two speeches we had, we need to get ready for the one we didn't want to give. That was nine years ago. And I remember walking out of that boiler room, it was about 2 a.m. by the time I left. And I went to get my car, I walked to the garage, I was right next to the boiler room, feeling so dejected. We had just lost to somebody who had sent my brothers and sisters to war in Iraq. We had just lost to somebody who had cut taxes for millionaires and billionaires while slashing services for working people who I grew up with. We just lost to somebody who let the energy companies write our climate bills. And I walked out with kind of the weight of the world on my shoulders, and I got to the parking garage, and it was locked. They had closed it. And I stood there shaking, just shaking the gates and how angry I was. And I remember going to a couple of meetings and sort of things that happened kind of in November, December after that election. And we as progressives in the States were faced with a couple of different tracks we could take. One 
We could get angry. We could blame it on a lot of things that we didn't have control over. Um, you know, we could sort of make up excuses. We could talk about how it was just 60,000 votes if we had switched them in Ohio. Would have been, we would have run the greatest campaign ever. Or we could look at ourselves in the mirror and take a moment of self-reflection and figure out what it was we were doing right, wrong. Because the polls showed on issues, people were with us. But we had failed to mobilize our folks, we had failed to run the kind of campaign and progressive community outside of the campaign to put us in a position to win. And so instead of sitting there and licking our wounds, we got to work. And we started brick by brick, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, organization by organization in the progressive community, rebuilding what we knew we needed to rebuild. And there were some key components of that, and we have some of those folks in the room today. Number one is we were getting beat in data analytics. We were getting beat. We did not have the best database. We did not have the best analytics on who to talk to. And so we started creating groups, like the Analyst Institute, you've heard from Regina this week, to figure out how we could compete on the data analytics front. We were losing on the message front, and there were multiple paths of that. One was on research. We weren't doing enough opposition research. We didn't have the infrastructure to get our message out. So we started creating groups like Media Matters and all these other uh, groups on the left to be able to combat the right wing, to be able to combat Fox News, to be able to get our message out. We were getting beat on the fundraising side. And it wasn't just because um, they had more wealthy folks given to their campaign because they were doing good things for wealthy folks by cutting their taxes. It was because we didn't have a diverse revenue stream. And because we had a lot of different people, kind of all in their own silos, giving money to different things, but there wasn't a coordinated effort. And so you heard from the Democracy Alliance, uh, and Kelly Craig had earlier today, and she's around. We created that institution to make sure our donor community was talking to, its, to each other, that we were figuring out how to invest in what mattered, and thinking about it long term, not just in a two-year cycle. And we had just kind of started, we weren't necessarily getting beat on this front, but we didn't quite understand the power of digital organizing and where it could take us. And I worked on the, the Deep campaign where we had sort of first realized we could raise small dollar donors, uh, small dollar donations online. And so we figured out what were we going to do to invest in some of those groups like the New Organizing Institute um, that would bring together online campaigners and be thinking about where we needed to be eight years out. And there were a whole host of other you know, things that we did. One of the other big ones is we looked at our grassroots organizing and we said, we're not organizing. What we're doing is mobilizing around elections, but we're not organizing. We've actually lost our, we had lost our past. The good history that we had of community organizing that came out of the farm workers movement, the labor movement, and other things in the states. We had gone away from that. We had gone to kind of a paid canvassing you know, at the end of the campaign, you go into these neighborhoods in October and you, then you try to build something, as opposed to the methodical kind of dogged organizing that really makes change. So we started to invest in organizations that would do that. And it was not one group, it wasn't one person that made the change happen over several years. It was all of those groups coming together. As I heard earlier today in the breakfast, it was people who had been on islands doing good work, coming together, making a long-term plan, and starting to slowly build back our coalition. And for me, that culminated in the video that I showed you. I had the, the fortune of uh, working on the president's campaign. I, I started uh, with him in uh, March of 2007, back when no one could pronounce his name, back when we were you know, a blip in the polls. And I was able to work with him over several years. And I think uh, one of the things I would disagree with that was said uh, yesterday from the stage is that elections matter. They matter a great deal. As somebody who grew up in a trailer park, the people I grew up with were the first people we sent to the Iraq war. The people I grew up with were the first people to need health insurance. The folks I grew up were the last to get a state-of-the-art education. They were the last to have economic justice at their jobs. And it mattered that we elected somebody that would provide health insurance for those folks. That would do what it takes to start closing the gap in terms of economic justice. But it wasn't going to be on campaigns alone. It has to be both. Both that infrastructure that we started to build on the nonprofit side, on the issue side, to make long-term change, as well as what we were doing on the campaign side.
On the campaign side, we needed to take those same lessons from our self-reflection that we had in 2004, the end of 2004-2005. And when I think about what we were able to do, and I think about the, the, the campaign office that we had in 2012, it was all of those pieces. It was the fundraising and the diverse revenue streams. It was bringing in grassroots folks. It was having a digital program that allowed us to go really wide and bring more people in and distribute our message and raise money and organize folks. It was all those different pieces that we in the progressive movement had been uh, bringing out that we were doing on the campaign and we were bringing people from those organizations into the campaign who had been doing all that work since 2004 and when the campaign was over we were there going back to do that work. It was a cycle building on itself. It was a foundation on the, on the progressive side that was allowing us to build a campaign on top, a foundation of the campaign on top of that foundation. And I'm a huge believer in Martin Luther King's quote that the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice. I'm also a huge believer in building a foundation so you can reach up and bend it quicker. And that's what we were trying to do on the campaign with the progressive uh, movement in the states. But what I want to talk about specifically is when you think about the, the, the six years I worked for the president, you hear a lot in the media about our digital program. You hear a ton about the technology. You hear a lot about uh, some of you know, the hype, you see movies that are a lot about the people who are right around him. But what you don't hear about enough is what was happening not in Chicago, not in Washington, D.C., but what was happening in rural Ohio, what was happening in uh, inner city Cleveland, what was happening in Florida, out across the country, is we were building, slowly and methodically, a real grassroots community organizing campaign to run a presidential race at the precinct level, at the ward level, at the city level, for the first time in history. And it didn't happen overnight. We did it by getting out there and taking, what we, what we did is we, 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 we sort of use our digital program and all the people that were coming in online, and we used those folks early on as just the folks that were our initial leads. And we went out and we met with them over coffee, one on one. We built relationships with them. We cut the whole country down into small neighborhoods with a couple thousand voters each. And we asked these volunteers to own that neighborhood said, look, if we're going to win, we need you to persuade this many voters in this area. And here's the list that we've been building for years that will allow you to do that. We're raising money online that will allow us to give you the resources to do that. We have a message that's been honed and we're disciplined about it for the first time in a long time. We want to train you on that. But you're going to run the campaign at the local level. It's not going to be run out of Chicago, it's not going to be run out of Washington, D.C., it's not going to be run out of our headquarters, it's going to be run at the very, very local level. And that all sounds good, but think about that for a minute. Some of you are doing this at the very local level across the country, where you have volunteers who you're bringing into the process, developing relationships, real relationships. When I would go out to the field and I would talk to field organizers, the best ones I'd say, tell me about your neighborhood team leaders. And they wouldn't tell me about how many doors they knocked on yesterday or how many phone calls they made. They'd tell me about their sons and their brothers and their sisters and what job they had and why they got engaged because they knew them. They had a real relationship with them. And those volunteers were coming in on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. to register voters in part because they believed in the president and they believed in their values being played out in the election cycle, but mostly because of that organizer who they developed a relationship with. And those folks we train. The biggest innovation of the 2012 campaign is that in 2008 we, we sort of did orientations. People would come in and we kind of give them a, a, a brief orientation about the state and then we'd send them out for staff. In 2012, so that's not good enough. If we're going to win in a tight election, we need to have the most trained and, and uh, staff we can possibly have and professionally develop them. I hired, or I got a team of 40 folks who are executive coaches. People that coach every day, um, you know, leaders of Chase Bank and other uh, institutions in the United States who were progressive, to volunteer their time to be a coach to one of our field directors in each one of those states. Not to talk to them about campaign tactics, but to talk about leadership and management and how to have difficult conversations and how to actually push people, how to fire people, how to hire people, how to do all those things that we don't talk about enough in the nonprofit and the campaign world. To be a leader and a manager, to be a coach, 
which is what we trained our folks to be. And then we invested a ton of money into training of those volunteer leaders. We didn't just give them a one-day training, we gave them a program. If you're going to be a neighborhood team leader, we're going to train you on how to use our data system. We're going to train you on how to use our digital. You're going to train you on how to on the message. We're going to train you on how to bring in recruit volunteers. The thing I'm most proud about is that when the campaign was over, we left behind people who didn't need that field organizer in their turf anymore. They know how to run a campaign. Many of them are running for office themselves. They're running other campaigns. They just won a governor's race in Virginia. We just helped pass gay marriage in Illinois. Those same volunteers are the ones who are helped doing those things, and they're going to be doing it for years to come because we invested in them. And it's not easy. It's not sexy. It doesn't get talked about. It's not on the front page of the newspaper. It's not in the spotlights. It's what happens when no one's paying attention. Those neighborhood team leaders in 2012 that turned out the vote we started recruiting in 2007. In fact, we started recruiting in 2005 in some of these other organizations and other campaigns that ran in 2006. And we invested in them. And it was what happened behind the scenes, behind the curtain, with that training and that organization that put those folks in place to where, on that night that I showed you the video of, in the morning at 5 a.m., all across the country, the time zone started to change, in 5,177 locations, in people's homes, in their garages, in the community centers, a neighborhood team leader got there and reported in for the day. And then their team members, the canvas captains and the phone bank captains and the data captains, showed up 30 minutes later and reported in. And then as the polls opened, other folks showed up and of our two million folks, hundreds of thousands of them who were volunteering for us came in that day and ran the election from their location as close to the polling booth as possible and turned out voters that they knew. Not some list that they had been given that they knew. People that they had persuaded. People that they had built relationships with. People that they knew. The difference in Appalachian, Ohio, which is a very sort of rural part of Ohio, between 2004 in 2012, is that in 2004, if I open my door, if I'm a voter, and I open my door, the person knocking on the other end is a paid staffer. We gave them all the talking points, we trained them, but they were from New York or California or somewhere else. In 2012, when I opened the door, the person in front of me was somebody in my neighborhood who I already had conversations with, who I saw at the parent-teacher meeting, who I saw at church, who I saw at the grocery store, who I trusted. And that was the kind of level of detail that we had to get to. Many of you are doing amazing things online. And you're getting very broad and you're bringing a ton of folks in. And it's very shallow in terms of the organizing, getting all the way to that level. And then others of you are doing very, very good, very, very uh, solid community organizing that gets very deep in a certain community. The question is, can you do both? And many of you are doing that. But can you do both? Can you run a campaign in the 21st century that uses all of the innovations of data analytics and digital technology to reach as many people as possible, to get your message out there, to talk to folks online where they're getting their information, but also have that organizing piece where somebody comes face to face and asks ask you to do something. Contact your legislator, vote for somebody, do something, get engaged in a meaningful way. That's your challenge. It's not easy. And many of you will look at me and say, yeah, it's very easy when you have a billion dollars. You raise a billion dollars in the campaign. And so you say, well, what lessons do you have for me in, when my organization when we have a couple hundred thousand dollars, or not even that? And the reality is, right now, after the campaign, I've been working with groups all over the place, whether it's, uh, we're gonna talk about some of these in a, a later session today. But you don't need a billion dollars to run that kind of community organizing campaign. But you do need to figure out a way on the fundraising side to raise the right amount of money so that you can invest in organizers on the ground. There's no substitute for it. To invest in the training and the people that can do the work to mobilize folks to do what you want them to do and have an amazing online program and all these other things that make campaigns real. And make them as effective as they possibly can be. The question is, are you investing in that in a real way? Do you really believe in it? Do you want to take a shortcut? 
Or do you want to do the hard work, the non-sexy work, the behind-the-scenes work, the work that no one's talking about, and build coalitions with other folks in the room? Because frankly, it's not about any of us. It's not about any of our organizations. It's not about any of us being up here on stage thinking that we're great because we won an election. It's about the people that you're trying to serve, the people that you're trying to organize, the people that you're trying to, the, the, the world that you're trying to leave your grandkids. That's what it's about. And you all wake up every day doing something amazing. You work with purpose. There's so many people, we heard it yesterday, so many people in the world, they were a little unhappy with the job they had. They wake up in the morning kind of just doing nine to five, doing their thing. You are fortunate enough to wake up every day with purpose, fighting to change the world. But it's not enough to just do that. We want to win. We have to win. It's not about doing it in the right way that makes us feel good. Every day I wake up thinking back to the kids I grew up with in the trailer park. And the little table we used to sit around my parents would talk about at what point next week we have to go to grandma's house to eat. Or what, what we were going to do for health insurance reform. Those are the people we're fighting for. And it's not enough to do a good job and feel good about the work we're doing. We need to win. People ask me what I love about the president. I love that he's calm. I love that he doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. I love that he's competitive. Because he knows it matters to people. And the work you do matters. So the question is, how do we come together at this moment for all of you that's very much like where we were in 2004. It was a self-reflective moment to say, well, just because we lost an election doesn't mean we did everything wrong. So there's things we're doing great, and there are great organizations that have done amazing things and I've heard a ton about them here. But it's also a self-reflection time. A time to say, what could we be doing differently? What do we have to build up in the nonprofit world here? What do we have to build up in the progressive community here that we don't currently have? Because we're fighting for those folks who are sitting around those tables worried about how they're gonna pay the bills, worried about the kind of climate that they live in, worried about the world in which they're gonna leave their kids. I think it takes a campaign and organizations that combine all those things I talked about, but the one missing piece I see over and over again is that commitment to organizing to putting people on the ground and putting the kind of training and in-depth focus on, the maniacal focus on reaching individuals. It's not 1980 anymore. Too many of our organizations rely on broadcast media and treat voters or citizens like consumers of a product that we can just sell. If we have the right message, if we test, full test the right message enough, and put up TV ads and send mail to folks, the easiest things we can do from some headquarters, we're gonna somehow have a big difference in the world. The world doesn't work like that anymore. And it certainly isn't gonna work like that in six, eight, 10 years. Folks are online, they're getting their information from all different places, we have to be relevant to them, we have to matter to them, and we have to talk to them individually. And that's what we tried to do over six years on the campaign and what we're trying to help other folks do in the future because it matters. And the work that all of you do matters to millions and millions of people. And it's not just here in Australia. You know, the work that you guys do, it was mentioned yesterday, people see it around the world as leaders of democracy, small d, and folks that have figured out how to get more and more people engaged in the process and are, in some ways, um, you know, have so much to teach the rest of the world. What you do matters. Not just to the 20 plus million folks here, but it matters to people all across the world. And it's, an, it's been an honor just to be in the room with, with all of you and to watch the, the great work you're doing. Um, I don't think I even came close to getting to what I really wanted to get to, was to have you kind of envision that neighborhood team program on the ground. And I don't think any talk for 20 minutes or 30 minutes will get there. Many of you came over, I talked about a dozen or two dozen of you who were in Virginia or Ohio or some other place on the campaign, and sort of saw what we were doing, and saw some of the things we weren't doing right, some of the things we were doing right. Um, I would challenge you to just keep reading and studying and learning from each other, and then committing to running campaigns that are focused on people and building those relationships. 
and building a narrative and building stories and talking to folks, couple that with the data analytics and the digital and a fundraising program that allows you to have multiple revenue streams. Put all those things together, keep learning, keep being hungry, and most importantly, just keep learning from each other in this room. You're gonna look back six years from now, and you're gonna have a video like I showed at the beginning of this, that you're all gonna be at that euphoric moment where you realize the work you started doing tomorrow leads to the kind of future that you want to have here in Australia. Um, so thank you for having me. I think um, I'm going to take a couple of questions. Um, and again, just a great honor and a privilege to be with you all today.